We can hear you. You can hear me. Yes. Okay. Now, what you can hear me? Don't lie to me. Okay. So this is a talk that might be called more of that stuff we were just talking about, and uh, which is you know semi-accidental, but also uh, good. So I'm going to talk about how attosecond pulses are generated, and I'm a theorist, so I'm going to talk about it from a theoretical point of view. But I want to convince you that it's really uh, a very interesting process that couples both time and space in a way that, that uh, allows for attosecond light to be generated. So first, let me say that uh, I'm from Louisiana State University, and there, Medegarda and I run an attosecond theory group professors there, and we have a number of talented um, postdocs and students that have contributed to the work that you will see today, especially a postdoc named Meng Shi Wu. Um, and also there are two students from the group, Paul, who is there, and Noah, who is there with the beard. Let's just clear about it. Uh, <laughs> that are here, and you can talk to them as well. And um, so in our own little theoretical bubble, uh, we would know very little. But we've had, over the years, many, many experimental collaborators, especially these first two groups, Anne Loyer and Ron Moritzen at Lund University, which, if you don't know, is a university in southern Sweden, just across the channel from Denmark. And Lou de Moro, who, was, uh, who is in Ohio State University now, and a bunch of other people that we've worked with over the years. And, um, this is something that you know I could just really recommend highly to you if you're planning a career as a theorist, uh, especially in a field like ultrafast physics, which is really technologically driven and driven by very clever people doing experiments. You really need to somehow figure out how to get these people to talk to you, and that's what we've been lucky to do over the years, and we've learned a lot from that. So what I want to talk to you about is something that we sort of specialize at LSU in, which is that we have a focus on treating strong field single atom physics, but also coupled to the propagation of the driving and emitted radiation. So both the propagation of the femtosecond IR pulses that you've been hearing about, and also the propagation of the emitted XUV radiation that you've been hearing about, to sort of how does this actually yield something that you see in an experiment. And so the shorthand for this is that we solve both the time-dependent Schrodinger equation in some approximation and the Maxwell wave equation in some approximation at the same time. And we try and do both of these things as well as we can so that we can understand uh, which of the effects that are seen are microscopic, which is to say they occur at the single atom level, and which of them are macroscopic phenomena, which is to say they the induced polarization in each atom works together to make a polarization in the medium that leads to the emission or absorption, as I'll talk about in the next two lectures of light. So this lecture is really about the emission of light. Uh, the next two lectures are about the absorption of light, but it's the same sort of story both times. And so to do this, uh, we've, when you put this together, we think of this as a numerical nonlinear medium. So you've been hearing about actual physical nonlinear we make a numerical nonlinear medium, and this allows us to separate the microscopic single atom effects from the macroscopic propagation effects. And we do this because it's really the only way that I know of to look at these things independently and how they interact and really break them apart. In experiments, you can try and do this. Um, there's two sort of barriers to it. Number one, people are usually not interested in figuring out exactly how their experiment, how their production of light work. They're, they're interested in using the light. If you go to them and you ask them to really take apart their experiment and do it in great detail for the, and walk around the whole parameter space and figure out how it really works, they're not going to keep talking to you because they want to get on with their lives. The other thing is to really figure out to separate microscopic and macroscopic effects. The easiest way to do that is you would sort of eliminate the macroscopic effects and you would make them as small as possible and you would really like to get to the single atom limit. That's also the limit of no photons. So it's a, you know, that's a, that's a common problem. Perfect data comes from no signal, right? Okay, so, so there's a real, that's my pitch for why you would want to do this numerically. We did not build this numerical nonlinear medium to sort of do optimization problems or quantum control problems. 
it's still sort of beyond uh, the uh, technology to do things like that. But it is a very good tool for understanding what's going on. So anyway, enough of that. The equations that we'll solve, the whole point of the numerical nonlinear medium is that we can march in time and space. So we solve the TDSE by marching forward in time from some initial condition to some final condition. And we march the Maxwell wave equation from the back of the medium where the driving laser enters out to the front and see what comes out the front. And then you can look at it in the near field, in the far field, you can bounce it off a mirror. All of these things correspond to mathematical operations that you can do on the signal once it has actually emerged from the medium. So it's, it's marching. Um, and then there are two messages here. The space-time coupling, there's space-time coupling inherent in all high harmonic generation experiments and at a second pulse generation experiments. Um, and theory is the way to unravel these, and then this is sort of the take home message, the at a second pulses. They're really generated by a macroscopic number of ionizing medium, uh, ionizing atoms, interacting with the focused laser beam. So you have to you have to treat that in order to see what's really going on, which is unfortunate because it would be easier just to think about one equation or the other. I admit that. So here are sort of some main ideas, in case I don't have time to finish. The first is sort of one of my favorites, which is that single atoms don't produce out of second pulses. So, you know, you, you have to get at that. The radiation that is emitted by single atoms, if you want to think of single atoms as emitting radiation, it still has to be filtered in frequency, in time or space, and frequently all three in order to actually produce a usable attosecond pulse. So the idea that there's an atom sitting there and you do something to it and it emits an attosecond pulse and it's just n times that is what's going on in your experiment where n is your number of atoms is just false. Um, now, that said, there is an attosecond time scale at the single atom level. That's what we've been talking about. This is the ionization, the acceleration, the return of the electron each half cycle of the laser field. The three-step model that was worked out in Ottawa and in Livermore in the early 90s. Um, any process that produces usable attosecond pulses relies on combining this mi these microscopic time scale with macroscopic effects. And, and so we see here the space-time coupling inherent in high harmonic generation, at least I hope to convince you is inherent. It allows many experiments to see, succeed, even if you don't really understand why they succeed when they do, because there's often a simple-minded microscopic uh, explanation and then you ignore everything else and say, well, my experiment worked because I measured some light. So my favorite example is the first measurement of a single attosecond pulse, which was made in 2001 by Ferenc Krauss and collaborators. That was not understood at the time. It worked. The explanation that was given was not true, uh, as as Ferenc would, would uh, freely admit, um, not, you know, very loudly, but... Uh, uh, but they were very helpful, in, and we used this numerical nonlinear medium in an early application to sort of figure out why their experiment had worked. And it's kind of a fun story. It's not meant to, as a, to deprecate anything. It's an amazingly wonderful experiment that was done in 2000. Just use it as an illustration. Here's the sort of, uh, on the theorist, so we have to have a lot of equations. I actually don't have a lot of equations, so I took the equations that I had and I put them up front. But this is basically where we're <coughs> going to get to, which is we're going to be solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which you recognize here, where I have an electron, or electrons, that are driven by some time-dependent field. And um, we will calculate the time-dependent dipole from the Schrodinger equation by marching forward in time, starting with some initial condition going forward. And then we're going to solve Maxwell's equation by marching forward in space. So we're going to take the polarization that we get out of solving the Schrodinger equation at some point in the gas, and we're going to use that to march forward. So D, dz here is where I, am I in the gas. Z equals zero is the beginning of the gas, and I have a first order equation in Z. And so this is going to allow me to specify an initial condition at the back end of the gas and space march my way forward, plane by plane by plane, to the end. I'll explain better how this works. But 
how are these things coupled? Well, it's this line right here. The polarization is this Fourier transformed polarization, so the same way Paul used it, is given by the density of atoms somewhere in the gas times the single atom time dependent dipole, Fourier transform, that is a function of the driving field at that point in the gas. Yes? Uh, question maybe because I was distracted for a minute. Uh, why did you drop the second derivative in Z? It's coming. Okay. So the, yeah. So the second derivative um, makes it impossible to do this space marching thing. So right. we have to get rid of that because the second derivative gives you oh, right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And so what you'll see is by we have dropped the second derivative in what is essentially the paraxial approximation. Right. And what you're ignoring then is is light that goes backwards. Right. And we're interested in the driven coherent process that that generates light that goes forward. But and does it make you nervous or very short pulses to do that? Ah, to do it for very short pulses? Yeah. No. No. I'll show you nervous. that. We'll get to that. Okay. So this is actually something called the slowly evolving wave approximation, which um, Thomas Bravich worked out in the late 90s. And it really is amazing because it works as long as you can ignore the backward propagating light, which you know basically these experiments are done at gas densities. So this is not a problem. Uh, this actually works down to the single cycle limit. Yeah. And, and, um, and Andre Vondrak and collaborators have solved the full uh, Maxwell wave equation in these conditions, and they get nothing different, okay. as they shouldn't, because the approximations really are very good. Yes? Oh, so, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Blue sweatshirt. Okay, so uh, is it a single electron wave function? Or? It can be what you want. So what is my initial state? Is it the Your initial state is the ground state. Okay. So the atoms are just hanging around. And then along comes the laser pulse. Um, so, and again, I put this here just to sort of say what we're going to see later. Do you, do you take the nuclear the core space, the uh, atomic core space? So they are uh, the core space. They don't move in the field, right? They don't move in the time that it takes the field to go by, which is a few femtoseconds. <coughs> That's right. Yeah, ten femtoseconds, they don't move right. That's true. Yes. Um, so it looks like you were not implementing the full E algorithm for your uh, Maxwell's equations? The full what? E algorithm? Uh, no. So this is just, you know, again, this is the equation that you want to solve. And I, you know, uh, it is, uh, the, the whole point of it is, I mean, I'll, I'll show you the derivation in a little while. But the whole point of it is that here, I wanted to just to see that here you have a first derivative in time of the wave function. So you're marching forward in time. And here you have a first derivative, derivative of, the, um, of the position along here. And let me put you a little bit at ease. This is actually, this equation is derived in a, in a coordinate system that moves at the speed of light through the, through the medium. So this is where the first derivative comes from. When you make that, when you make that jump to the moving system. You generate a cross term, which is this first derivative. And, and that's the thing that turns out to be much more important than the second derivative term which you can draw. And then um, in your Hamiltonian for the in the Schrodinger equation? Yes. Are you using a, a two level atom? No, most often what we do is, is we do the single active electron approximation. So this would be uh, a one electron wave function for some valence electron, for instance, in the outer shell of neon or argon. And this would be a pseudopotential that describes that. But, you know, so okay. just, you can think of it in that way. So uh, I'm confused by how you move it to be completely frame at the speed of light. So is will it get a get to that? Again, transformation? We will, we will get to that. I, I can see now throwing the equations up front. <laughs> so the second question, what, yes. what is D? What is the, the uh, D equals rho times So D here is the dipole moment of the single atom. So the, so the Schrodinger equation generates D somewhere in the gas, depending on what the electric field that it's driving it is at that point in the gas. But it's a multi-atom. 
Yes. Uh, yes. So you, I cannot take the electrons separately, or can I? Perhaps we get to that. <laughs> okay. So moving along, I mean, I understand the question, but it's a much better answer than just a few minutes. So the problem that we're trying to solve was laid out well by Paul, because you'd like to break through this femtosecond barrier. And Maxwell's equations basically say that if you've got less than one cycle of the radiation, you're not going to be able to take a pulse and move it undistorted somewhere else. So you can make sub-cycle pulses, but they're just, you can think of them as like blobs of jello, and that's not very useful. So you'd like to get beyond that femtosecond barrier. This requires an enormous bandwidth. Uh, so to give you the scale of what you need to do, here's a 5 femtosecond IR pulse. It has a bandwidth of a fraction of electron volt. This is huge, hard to make, high technology, but it's still more than it's 5 femtoseconds long. So, and what you really want to do is you somehow want to take that sub-EV bandwidth and use it to make something that has about 30 electron volts of bandwidth, right? That's, this is a 150 attosecond pulse. Fourier transform. So here's the here's the uh, bandwidth limited bandwidth of 150 attosecond pulse. Here's my five femtosecond pulse, right? So that's sort of the problem you're trying to solve. That's a very nonlinear problem, right? And of course, just to remind you, the pulse length in the best case is related to the bandwidth by this relationship. This is for Gaussian pulses, and of course, this assumes this is the group delay. This T sub G. So you have to make a lot of frequencies, and you have to get them to all show up at the same place at the same time. That's a short pulse. Right? Both of those things have to happen, so that's hard. So here's my movie, and this is a movie from an actual calculation with the time of Schrodinger equation, and there is the time of wave packet. And we'll see this movie twice, but this is basically a calculation. It's done in neon, uh, 8 times 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter. So watch it now. This is, we're looking at the electron density. Here's the potential. And you'll see as it starts, you get this wave packet that comes out. It really does. Part of it really is driven back. Now we got another wave packet over here, so we got a lot of interference going on. But this is a solution to the time to time Schrodinger equation. You can do it in whatever gauge you want. You get the same answer because I'm uh, what I'm showing you here is the uh, wave function squared, which is a gauge independent quantity. So you do the calculation different ways in different gauges and make sure you see the same thing. So Sometimes you will hear people say, it's a two-dimensional product. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's in R and Z, and then there is, oh, and there is cylindrical symmetry. Okay. Sometimes you will hear people say that, that tunneling is sort of a gauge dependent uh, concept because, of course, this idea of the distorted potential uh, uses a particular form of the of the interaction, and this is undoubtedly true, right? The distorted the potential that I write down is different in different gauges, but the wave function square that I calculate is not different, and I would uh, submit that there seems to be a wave packet coming out there. So I I, I like to know. And so you get this comb of odd harmonics that's been seen since 1987. There's a lot of bandwidth here. Right? You take a, a selection of harmonics, and there's a huge amount of bandwidth. And so maybe you have what you need to make a short pulse. So that's good. And so you have, again, this sort of three-step model of ionization. Uh, you pick up energy in the field. Uh, the part of the wave packet that has picked up energy uh, enters the same spatial region where the ground state still is, and this gives you a time-dependent dipole. It's this overlap between a piece of the wave function that's in the continuum and a piece of the wave function that is still in the ground state. They have phases that vary at very different rates, and the difference in those phases gives you the time-dependent dipole. And so there really is a, a short time scale event here. And so you get this sort of XUV generation. You have the low order harmonics are sort of perturbative, still going down like you would think. But then you get this, this plateau, which here it goes out to the 30th harmonic order. It can go out to the 300th or the 1,000th. And then you get a cutoff. And the position of this cutoff depends basically just on the intensity of the laser that you're using. The 
scale where this plateau is, which is, that was the question about the conversion efficiency, that depends on everything. So that's, that's what the experimentalist is always trying to optimize. And so you have these what we would call recollision based at a second light sources that are sort of based on the idea that depending on when the electron tunnels, uh, that defines a time when it will return, and this gives you a time scale for this at a second emission. So um, you have single and multiple at a second pulses that are routinely made in the 20 to 100 EV range, sometimes beyond. Uh, not much. So, and so you get this sort of simple single atom theory. Yes? We also have uh, to ask uh, questions. You have yeah. yeah. okay. so, uh, In the previous slide, yes. uh, <clears throat> I, I can't exactly remember what, did, what was done in that CUDA and the 93 paper. So, with presumably some TDSC calculation. But then what you described here is uh, the three-step model. So yes. did, at that time, did anyone try to compare fully up to TDSE with TDSE based on just kind of continuum and ground state, which is essentially what you have in the three-step model? Well, now, now, we go through a bunch of, now we go through history. But I mean, the, the, the paper that, that I would, so call it a paper, there's a paper from our group uh, in collaboration with Lou DeMoros that that appear at the same time as a note about Paul's paper saying Paul's paper is coming. Um, and that compares uh, TDSE calculations to experiments on photoelectrons and high harmonics. And then the, essentially the three-step model is at the end of that paper because it says why would these two cutoffs be different? For us that was the motivation. Okay. Right? So for us, the, what I went around asking people for a while is why is the high harmonic cutoff different from the photoelectron cutoff? And the photoelectron cutoff wasn't measured because they had only low repetition rate lasers at that time. So that's something that came with the high repetition rate lasers. So also it was sort of known from calculation, TDSE calculations that we were doing that you could get the same high harmonic spectrum by just taking account of the electron wave packet in the continuum and the ground state. And then you would get the whole thing, yeah. So we did full calculations and then approximate calculations that way. And I'll show you that expression the next time. And then Machak Levenstein, uh, in, along with some other things, took that as you know good evidence that the strong field approximation would work. So I think it all kind of falls together, along with the classical view. Uh, anyway, this leads to what I want to use as a straw man. Um, yes? So um, you're using the classical description of the electromagnetic field. Yes. And um, so as far as I know, people use these when there's a uh, large number of phones, and yes. fields can be described as a coherent boson. Yes. So is it in this case, how yes. many photons are generated by So the that's right. So typically what we teach, if you teach a quantum optics course, you say you're, you, you have to quantize the field if you have sort of one or, one or so photons per cubic wavelength. That would be a good thing, right? So you ask the wavelength of your light, and you say, how many photons on average are there in a cubic wavelength for those? And we have those. So we're good. But it's an excellent question. Yeah. So the electric, so the electromagnetic field here is, is classical, but it's driven by a quantum mechanical system. So, which is a, a familiar step in quantum. You know, if you take a quantum optics course, right? They'll spend uh, time in that before you quantize the electromagnetic field. First, you have a classical electromagnetic field and a quantized atom. So here's the sort of simple story is that if you had a single pulse, say an 80 out of second pulse, you would get that if you could restrict your electron to return basically just one time. Right? If you had just one of these ionization and return events, you'd get a single pulse. And if you repeat this process many, many half cycles, you'll get a train of out of second pulses. And indeed, this does; these are the two sort of uh, categories of sources, shall we say. 
people do experiments. They make out of second pulse trains, they make single pulses. It isn't this simple, let's say, especially the first one. So let me just quickly say one way that you could think about doing the TDSE calculation, because I actually want to defer that until the next lecture and not really talk about that. I want to talk to you today about the space-time coupling. So that really means talking about the Maxwell wave equation. But just to give you a, an example of how you would do this in the single active electron approximation, you would calculate some ground state wave function in a single active electron. So you'd have a pseudo-potential for the other electrons that you may maybe better Hartree-Fock or a better calculation, whatever is your favorite way of doing this. This will give you an initial state that, de that describes the um, valence electron state as if it were the ground state of the pseudo-potential. Then you do a numerical integration of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. For each step in time, you evaluate something, the time-dependent dipole, the time-dependent velocity, the time-dependent acceleration, whatever's, whatever you like. Uh, this is something that will allow you to calculate the polarization response of a single atom. And then the dipole <coughs> spectrum, or again, the velocity or acceleration, is given by taking that time-dependent signal and Fourier transform. So that's sort of, these are the elements of the single atom. We need a ground state, we need a time-dependent wave function, we get a time-dependent response. After the whole pulse is over, we Fourier transform that and get a frequency response, which is, has both an amplitude and a phase. And so, how does that correspond to the trajectory picture? Well, the trajectory, in the trajectory picture, the trajectory depends on the time of release, and then it can have zero, one, or multiple returns to the ion core. So for instance, this is time, this is distance away from the atomic core, and you can see, depending on very small differences in the ionization time, you can have an electron that just sort of drifts away, an electron that just sort of keeps bouncing back. Its energy, when it returns, is the derivative of this curve. So you can see here the energy is very low at the time of return. Here is an example of a trajectory that has three returns. It has an early return with pretty high energy. It has a second return and an even longer return. So it has a short, long, and longer trajectory. You might think of it that way. And then it drifts away. You might say, how realistic is this? Here's a, a full calculation, time-dependent Schrodinger equation. This is for actually two electrons in one dimension, but I've done a cut here along one dimension. And so again, I have time going this way, and I have distance away from the atom going this way. Here's the electric field that's driving this. So you can see it turns on. It's pretty flat in amplitude, and then it turns off at some point. And you can see that these space-time trajectories look pretty real, I would say, right? because you really can identify ionization events where you have, again, these wave packets going on. And you really do have kind of return events, and then the whole thing turns off. So what, sorry, what are those? Um, this is like air or spaghetti. Why, why are this, the amplitude split, split into the spaghetti? Yeah, why is it sort of a, yeah. it's an interference pattern from all the different ways that it can happen. So you always see that when you plot the wave function. Fine. Yeah, you, you, don't, you only know, you only know what you have at the time you ask the question. And if there are multiple ways to have gotten that answer, then you'll always get these striking patterns across there. You'll get an appearance. Can, can the, the flat cutoffs are the absorbing boundary conditions that you have put on the At the outside there? Yeah. There's an absorber somewhere. It's, it's very far away. But things at the top and the bottom. It's, 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 yeah, I think I think just that's not just something I've done to to, to make plotted. it clear. I think it's just a cut. Now the, the box is much bigger. <coughs> I don't know. So just to be completely clear, uh, what do you describe? Is it just one initial condition, or, or did you take? Which so back back here at zero time before the electron is turned on, we're just hanging around in the ground state. Okay. And then you turn on the... And then I just plot the density. That's it. As a function of time, that's right. And so most of the density, right, where it's really high along here, this corresponds to the electron staying in its ground state. Right. 
I mean, Paul talked about the ionization event. You end up with a large piece of the wave function sitting in a very localized region of space, and a small piece of it that, that travels very far away, tens and maybe a hundred atomic units, right? And it's picking up, having its phase greatly modified by the field in a way that the other piece is not having it modified. And then you bring these two things back together and you look at the interference that you get, uh, right, the time-dependent dipole, and then the phase beating between these two pieces. So it's, it's, it's quite spectacular. Because of these interferences, you could also think it's a bit like a gradient, actually. I, right, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute that. I think that's I, I think that's fine too, and then it doesn't get a certain number of people that have very specific ideas of what Schrodinger cats are upset uh, because it's not the point, <clears throat> right? I mean, you often find this in physics, right? You use a certain language, and then a whole bunch of people get upset, and then you say, "Well, I didn't even <laughs> it wasn't even important that I said that." Could we get back to what we were talking about, right? I mean, this, but, you, but you can't but you can't publish a PRL with the Schrodinger cat. Can you? No, no, that's true. So here is an example. Here's the release time. Here's a half a cycle of the laser field. And the laser would have peaked back here at the quarter cycle. And now, as a function of when you would release the electron, and this is, again, kind of a classical calculation, here is the return energy that you have, because that determines the, um, the frequency component of the polarization that you get. And you can see that for most return energies up to this uh, cutoff, a little bit above 3 UP. There's at least two ways to be made. And when you go below about 2.4 UP here, you have even more ways. So first you have two ways, then you have four ways, then you have six ways. So it brings in successively more and more ways that any given harmonic could be made. So the maximum energy is given by the ionization principle. That's the binding of the ground state. And the 3 UP is what the continuum piece could pick up. And then uh, it says, like it says there. If you're, if you're sort of thinking about why it is this classical description for the piece that goes out into the continuum work, I guess I would say for that, for one thing, the density of states there is really high, right, in the continuum. And so uh, you should always be able to get back to a classical description, more or less, in such a case. Yes? So um, I'm a bit confused about the spatial profile of the emitted radiation. So uh, if, if uh, the light comes along Z, the Z direction, then the dipole is sketched along Z, and, right? No, the light is traveling along Z, so it's, the polarization is oscillating in the, per oh, sorry. Okay. In the perpendicular sorry. direction. Yeah. And so then the polarization is in that direction, and the emission will be, again, in the direction of the propagating light. So it will be, yeah, okay. but also sideways. Yeah, all and the sideways. It has a cylindrical sound here. And, yes, and uh, what happens to the sideways emission? Uh, no, there's no sideways emission. Well, actually, I have a good slide on that, too. So if you'll let me get to that slide, I'll show you that. Wonderful question. So the other thing I want to say is when you think about these space-time trajectories and you say that you could calculate them classically, the sort of way to put that on a firm quantum mechanical footing would be to say that, well, I have a bunch of possible space-time trajectories that I can take. And what Feynman would tell me to do is calculate all of them. Calculate the classical action for each of them. The classical action here is dominated by the field. That's the energy that the field is giving. And then look for who gives stable contributions to that action. In other words, I have a particular, I have the um, dipole moment contributing to the Q harmonic. I have a whole bunch of different space time paths that could give rise to that, corresponding to ionization time t prime and a return time t. I calculate the amplitude for each of those. I tap onto it, e to the i, this phase. The phase just comes from the classical action. And then I ask myself, who makes the biggest contribution to this sum? Right? Well, it's going to be those paths for which the action is stationary, for which it varies very little. 
And when you have a very high density of states, when you have essentially a situation where classical trajectories are allowed, those will also be the ones that have actions where small variations are stable. And so this is my one slide sort of try to get you to think that maybe it's OK to think about these classical trajectories. They are the ones that make stable contributions to this sum of all possible paths. Think of all the paths that you want. But just do, as Feynman said, add up, uh, tap onto each one a phase, which it gets from basically the kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy comes from being accelerated in the field. So this is why we can do this. It says only a few paths are important. We often say that it's only the first two. It's actually more like the first three or four in most cases unless you really look at the high <coughs> radiation. OK, so let me think about, yes? What is my time? You have. When am I aiming for? What's Another 20, 25 minutes. OK. Uh, so the final state for this electron, which is making harmonics, uh, is the ground state, right? So this is not my view of it. I mean, in other words, if we're sticking with that the electromagnetic field is, in other words, it's not the most consistent view. It's fine to say that the final state is the ground state, yes. But let me give you another way to think about it, which is that since we're thinking about the electromagnetic field classically, right, and what we care about is what is the polarization response of the atom, right? And the polarization is big when you have two states, that you get a high frequency polarization that's big when you have two states that are separated far in energy that are both occupied and that have a high spatial overlap. And that's what happens as this wave packet comes back by. So there's no need, there's no, in our calculations, nobody makes a transition back to the ground state, right? Because there's no, way to release this energy to the field. It's a classical field. So it would be much better, I mean, I, I understand recombination as a, as a very easy to grab onto concept, but it's not instantiated in the calculations because it would be treating millions of photons with a, with a uh, formalism that was most appropriate for one photon per wavelength per cubic wavelength. <laughs> so here's the recipe. Let me just say this. So the recipes that people employ, and then I want to say why phase matching and my, my macroscopic effects are important. You would say, I've got a gas of atoms. Here they are. I put in frequency omega. This is the driving frequency. And I get out of it a bunch of harmonics. And I get this nice plateau, and then it has a cutoff somewhere, which we had to convince PRL was one word. <clears throat> they didn't want that. And so here's the first sort of selecting, right? There's no attosecond pulses here. This is a single atom spectrum. There's no attosecond pulse. So you start doing selecting, filtering, gating, to try and get to attoseconds. One thing you can do is spectral selection. You can choose some of these harmonics, right? You have a comb of harmonics in the frequency domain. That leads to a train of pulses in the time domain. The bandwidth of each, of the, sorry, the time of each of these pulses is <coughs> inversely, inversely proportional to how many harmonics you select here, right? And the, the time envelope of the total train is given by the inverse of the frequency uh, bandwidth of one of the harmonics. Okay, So the bandwidth of one of the harmonics determines the overall time structure. The bandwidth of all the harmonics together determines the, band the time structure of the individual pulses. So a lot of harmonics give you uh, very narrow individual pulses. Another um, way to do this would be to say, I'm going to spectrally select only the harmonics right out at the highest energy, 
And I will say that there was only one way, that one time that those could have been made, and I would get maybe a single out of sec single pulse that's maybe 250 out of seconds long. And this is the recipe that was implied. So for instance, if you think of this as sort of a spectral selection, right? Here is in time, here is the energy of the returning electron, and you can see for most energies, there are two times when you can return. But as you get out to the highest energy, the cutoff energy, it really gets squeezed into basically only one way to make it. So again, we can think of spectral filtering where we, where we did have two pulses, right? If we were talking about energies down here. If we select energies only out near the cutoff, maybe we can get only one pulse somewhere else. And so this is an example of spectral filtering as a time gate. And it's this sort of back and forth, push me, pull you, sort of between time and space and frequency that actually gives you out of second pulses. Another example of this would be if you have out of second pulse trains, right? So here would be uh, the, the pulses that you would get if you just thought about a single atom. So you get every half cycle, you have many different bursts of radiation because you have all these different trajectories that can give rise to things. But if you look out near the, the end of the plateau at 2.8, then you get down to just two bursts per half cycle. That's the red. And if you look right out at the cutoff, you have the green. And if you look back here in the plateau, then things get even more complicated. So you can filter spectrally and get a different time behavior. Now let's look at the, the standard recipe. This is what uh, you would do to make single out of second pulses. More or less today, this is what's following. You would take the shortest driving pulse you could get, say two cycles, four to five femtoseconds, maybe even a little less than two cycles. You'll do spectral selection, look only at the cutoff harmonics, and you will have carrier phase envelope control so that in your two cycles, maybe only one or so delays will be important. Here is the carrier envelope phase. So here's the envelope of your light pulse, your driving pulse. Here is the actual at the given. So as you change the carrier envelope phase, you see how the form of the electric field of the driving laser changes. For some phases, you get basically just one big pulse and two smaller ones. For other phases, you get two big pulses. Right. So by changing the carrier envelope phase, you change how many ionization groups are important. So this was the idea that Krauss and uh, his group were following. They said, let's control the carrier envelope phase of a few cycle pulse. If I choose the carrier envelope phase correctly, and I select just out at the end of the plateau, I will get essentially one single out of second pulse. And if I change the carrier envelope phase by pi over 2, go from a cosine to a sine form, then I'll have two ionization events, I'll get two pulses. And they do this, and it, and it really does kind of work. And, and now we come to it. But wait, aren't there many atoms, right? So what's really going on? Well, what are you measuring in one of these experiments? Certainly not the radiation from one atom, right? The radiation from one atom would go in a dipole pattern, which is very broad. And the radiation that you see coming out of the end of the medium is really narrow. It's milliradians. So it's very narrow, right? Because what are you measuring? You're measuring the electric field emerging at the end of the nonlinear medium. Or really, you're measuring the square, but you're measuring the intensity. And sometimes you can do experiments to measure the phase as well. But certainly, that's what you're measuring. And so what you are seeing is constructive interference in the forward direction. So all these, all the radiation that goes off to the side adds up incoherently, uh, um, interferes to nothing, and you get a very strong, very narrowly focused, essentially laser-like, even though it's not a laser, right? You can point this at stuff, right? Which you can't do if you just had a bunch of dipole emitters and sort of randomly going. 
So you need constructive interference in the forward direction, and that is what's seen. So you have all these little dipoles working together to get the radiation going in the forward direction. Now, why do they work together? Well, truth be told, they don't work all that well right. together. Yeah. But to the extent to which they do, this is what you see. Okay. I mean, in other words, this comes together. back to the phase matching issue. Right, so, so do you have to work hard to get phase matching, or is it kind of happens? So, it happens. And it's not great because the conversion efficiency would be something better than 10 to the minus 6 or 5 if it worked really well, right? I mean, in a BBO crystal and you're doing second harmonic generation, the efficiency is 50%, right? So it's way, way off that, right? It's because the coherence length is very short. Right, okay. All right. So you need a large medium to get a lot of signal, but the coherence length is short. So there's a trade-off there. And you have to do the, tri the tricks that the old guys like Bruno and the quasi phase matching and things like right. that. Right, right. They essentially don't don't work. Right. What is the coherence length? What and here's the but here's the thing, and I think this is like an important lesson. There's there's two essential aspects to this. Number one is you really want the light for many many years and maybe for many years to come. If you have a just a normal laboratory and you want some XUV short pulse XUV radiation, this is your way to make it. Right. When somebody makes something that's 10% efficient, might be out of business, right? That's okay, because I'm not really in the business, right? I'm just a theorist. So the point is, you really want the light, right? The other is, it runs on water. It runs on water. The fuel is water, right? Another, the fuel is these IR photons, which are in fantastically, incredibly cheap, right? So it's those two things that work together to beat the fact that the phase matching is not all that wonderful. Is that semi-clear? Yes? So what is it, phase coherence um, in this case? Uh, uh, sorry, coherence length. Sorry. It varies. I mean, that's, that is the thing that varies as you change everything. So it can and you know, medium length. You try and get something that's a fraction of the I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. So, what is phase matching? Just for, I think Paul said it well, but I'll say it with an equation. Uh, you have to match the phase front of the propagating XUV light to the phase front of the newly generated XUV light. Right? So the XUV light made at the back of the gas, when it propagates to somewhere in the middle where new XUV light is being made, you would like that to be in phase. So they would go off together, amplifying each other. Okay, and to some extent they do that. So the Q harmonic wave vector is K sub Q. The length of it is just Q times omega over C, basically omega v over I. And what direction is it heading? Well, that's what you learn from phase matching, right? The direction of the source radiation is given by the by the derivative of the phase. So you have a spatial phase. The gradient of that gives you the direction of the source. Right? So that you can think of the radiation as going downhill in some sense. Right? So um, if you have flat wave fronts, then the radiation will just go in the perpendicular direction. If you have a curved wave front, then the radiation will be dispersing. And, and this is exactly the question that you're asking, I think, right? Which is, why is it sometimes broad? Why is it sometimes, where does it go? And so if you think about the wave equations that we solve for the harmonic fields, uh, for instance, you have a, a transverse derivative, you have a longitudinal second derivative, you have the um, linear term, uh, and you have the nonlinear polarization that's driving this, right? It's this nonlinear polarization that you need to calculate from some solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. It could be a really good solution. It could be a approximate solution. It could be something you make up. But whatever it is, that's then what is going to be the source term for you in, in the new radiation. And so you get things like this. So first off, what is the focused laser beam doing? Well, the focused laser beam has wave fronts that are diverging 
outward on the back side of the focus and are going, I'm sorry, inward on the back side of the focus and outward on the front side of the focus. So the laser light is traveling from left to right and the wave front is changing. It's being flat right in the focus. And so you have this, um, this gooey phase shift of, of pi as you go through the focus. So those are the wave fronts to do the focusing. You also have a dipole phase, right, which is the phase of this dipole radiation, which turns out to be proportional to the intensity of the laser light. And the main message, which I don't want to belabor too much because it's real detail, but you can ask me about it in as much detail as you want afterwards, is the different space-time trajectories that we've been talking about. These are characterized by alpha sub i here, coefficients, which for what we've called short trajectories, these coefficients are very small, and so the phase of the light is not very sensitive to the intensity at all. And for the longer trajectories, this phase is really big. It's like 10 times bigger. And so those trajectories give rise to light, which is very sensitive to phases that are very sensitive to the intensity. So now remember, phase matching means that you want to match the emitted wave vector somewhere in the gas to the emitted wave vector somewhere else. And this is, comes from the gradient of the phase due to the focusing of the laser and the gradient of this dipole phase. And you have to make these things work together in order to get it. Right? And so essentially, you get two kinds of phase fronts from the single atom solution. You get, for tau 1, these are the short trajectories. You get phase fronts that are slowly varying in R and Z. They're gently curved. So they give rise to light, which goes just in the forward direction, very narrowly focused. The longer trajectory phase fronts have a strong intensity dependence to them. And remember, as we go off axis in the laser pulse, it's focused. So as we go off axis, the intensity drops. And so the phase varies. And so the phase front will be very curved, and you'll get things that diverge. So when you look at the single atom level, it's really, really hard to tell the difference between different trajectories because they're all mixed up together in there, right? The only thing you calculate is some amplitude for something to happen. And you get the amplitude for all the different ways that it happen. So all these trajectories are mixed up in your single atom solution. But in the far field of the propagated solution, they separate spatially. The short trajectory trajectories give rise to light that only goes forward, and the longer trajectories give rise to light which is more divergent. So in the far field, it's no trick to separate them as long as you have a signal. The trick is to get signal. So different macroscopic phase matching for different microscopic quantum trajectories. Yes? It's kind of a main question, but uh, can you get better conversion efficiency if you use uh, like a thin solid film instead of a gas? Because then you would get more atoms uh, within the coherence time. Uh, I, I know that there are other processes that can spoil this, so uh, I don't know. So people have tried this for many years. They've tried different things. They've tried liquids. They've tried uh, very thin solids. They've tried uh, clusters. That was really good. Um, so now, and you'll hear it from uh, in, in Paul's talk, people have succeeded in seeing harmonics from very thin materials, thin crystals. The main problem with that, as you can think, is you just destroy it. Because right? you're look, putting a lot of intensity in. And you're doing, you know, 10,000, you know, 1,000 and 10,000 pulses per second. I mean, it, it's just a damage issue, right? So gas is great. It just heals, right? And right away. But the, the material is <coughs> not. But so now, in principle, people are seeing harmonics from solids. And maybe they can get the, the number of the phase matching things, all that. At the moment, the actual number of photons coming out of the solids is very low. So it's not just turning it on, but there is something there. And the numbers of photons that people got out of clusters and liquids, it's also very interesting the process by which they're made, but it doesn't beat just go get a very big laser with a long focus and a high gas density. And, you know, that's, that's what you're competing with. 
It's a little bit like the solar energy problem, right? It's really cool to make solar energy, but then you've also got to compare it with how you're getting in, the cost for how you're getting energy now, right? If you're really going to get people to switch over. But, but not in Arizona. Hmm? But not in Arizona. Not in Arizona. That's right. So uh, the other thing, the last thing we need is, what about the laser beam itself? It's propagating through a rapidly ionizing medium. No ionization, no harmonics, no radiation, nothing to talk about, right? So there must be ionization in the medium, and this actually affects the driving laser because your, your ionization is producing free electrons that oscillate in the field, and that will produce uh, a response which is proportional to the driving electric field and the number of electrons that you have. So here's the second derivative of the polarization. These freely oscillating electrons make a contribution to that at more or less the driving field, and they change the refractive index. So you get a negative contribution to the refractive index. Varies in space and time. You get a large negative contribution to the refractive index on axis, because that's where the intensity <coughs> is high. You get a smaller contribution off axis. And so what happens I think it's on the next one. I hope it is. Yeah, here we go. That the beam diverges. In other words, here is your driving laser beam at the beginning of the medium where there's no ionization. And as it goes through and it starts to make ionization, the phase front starts to get bent and it diverges. So ionization puts a real cap on the maximum intensity that you can get in the medium. All right? You really can't just blast it all the plasma. Okay? You won't get to that high of intensity. So it makes the laser beam diverge. More than that, though, it also it adds a time-dependent phase to the laser um, propagating laser field, which corresponds to a change in the laser frequency. The change in the laser frequency turns out to be proportional to the rate at which free electrons are being produced. And since the NDT, right, the number of free electrons that have been produced, it's always zero or some number bigger than zero. So, and the NDT is always a positive number. So you always get a blue shift and, and or even more a chirp. So as you have, let's say, here's time. If I have a small amount of ionization, I'll get a small blue shift on the laser field as it goes through the medium. If I have a lot of ionization, I'll get a large blue shift and then and this actually changes the frequency of the driving laser field. So the frequency of the driving laser field, if I have a lot of ionization, it can be very different at the front end of the medium than from the back end where I enter it. Okay. We're almost ready for the good part of the story. So altogether, you got this intense pulse propagating through the ionizing medium. You got the spatial temporal shape changing dramatically. You got phase matching or not of the X-UV radiation. And so you get these attosecond pulses. They're generated by a macroscopic number of things. So if we want to describe an experiment, we have to simultaneously solve the Schrodinger equation and the Maxwell wave equation in what are pretty extreme conditions, we would, both for the Maxwell equation and the Schrodinger. Strongly driven, non-perturbative thing. It's a, it's a HPC level problem, strong field nonlinear optics. Here's again to remind you what we want to do. We want to solve the Schrodinger equation marching in time, the Maxwell equation marching in space. These are coupled by the polarization that is induced at any place in the medium. How do we get to this? Let me just say this in two slides. You start with the full Maxwell wave equation. Here it is. So here's the polarization that's driving it. Here's the electric field. You move through the gas at the speed of light, so you change to a time t prime, which is t minus z over c. You don't have to pick the speed of light. Pick the speed you want. All right. You could pick, pick some group velocity or something. That would be OK. In the transform time, here's now the um, Maxwell wave equation. And because I picked to go at the speed of light, I actually get two terms here that cancel. It's OK if I had picked. The group velocity, I would just have 1 over c minus 1 over some group velocity. This second derivative in time term is no problem to handle. Okay, But the simplest form is to pick the speed of light because it kills this term. 
exactly instead of leaving a small term. What is the term we dropped? We dropped the term that was the second derivative in z at the t prime coordinate compared to the term we kept, which is this one. It's this mix. There's two ways this mixed derivative gets made. That's why the factor of 2 is in there. It just comes from working it out. My homework assignment would be go from here to there. No problem. And dropping this term is the paraxial approximation. It's saying there's no backward propagating light. You're just ignoring that. So you could not do this at solid density, but up to really high density it works really well. And this is on the full laser field. So now this is the equation that we're left with in time, this time where we're moving along with the pulse at the speed of light. Now we Fourier transform with respect to T prime and we get the equation that I've been showing you all along. So we get something that's d by dz, and then we have an omega that comes from the d by dt prime. We still have our transverse derivative. We do that exactly. And we have our polarization in however much detail we want to put it in. Your polarization here could be just something your friend told you. Could be the strong field approximation. It could be from the Schrodinger equation, as good as you want to do it. Whatever it is, that's what's going to allow you to go. So you get a tool, which is a numerical nonlinear medium, which goes basically like this. You send a pulse in. You calculate the TDSE at one layer of atoms. You calculate the source term in that layer of atoms. You propagate that to the next level, to the next layer, using the Maxwell wave equation. And you keep doing that over and over until you get to the front of it. So let me see if I can push the button and make that happen again. So you march through layer by layer. In each layer, there's a bunch of atoms. You pick a, a bunch of them, maybe 50 of them, that are laid out. You calculate the TDSE for each of them. You get the polarization from that. So here are all the atoms in one layer. I pick 50 or 100 of them. I farm those out to 50 or 100 CPU cores. I solve the Schrodinger equation in hopefully under 10 minutes, as it turns out. That's sort of a figure of merit. Then you get back, and you just march through the gas. And so the problem breaks up very nicely. In the radial direction, we have a layer of atoms where we're solving an independent TDSE for each of these. So this is done in parallel. And then once you have the solution for one layer, you solve the Maxwell wave equation, you march to the next layer, and that's cheap. So you have expensive, cheap, expensive, cheap, expensive, but the expensive part is parallel. So there you are marching through the gas. Now we have all the needs, back to the experiment. So the, the experiment in 2001, they say we're going to do carrier envelope control, we're going to pick the right phase, we're going to get only one pulse, and, um, and, and that works. And here's the uh, experiment that was published in That Looks Like Science in 2004, where they did this. They had CEP control and they measured the, um, they used the XUV light to measure the um, IR laser uh, oscillation. So this, the fact that they can measure this IR laser oscillation perfectly like that tells them that they have just one pulse. Their, their prescription worked. It's really great. The problem is it's not 2001. So what happened in 2001? Did they not make a single out of second pulse? So here's the first aspect isolated at a second pulse. And this is Henschel et al. This is Ferenc Krauss's group in Nature in 2001. And the experiment works basically by the prescription that was given. They have, here are the steps that go through their experiment. You have a gas jet. You focus in a laser. In there, then a whole bunch of radiation is produced. There's a bandpass filter here, which is something that selects off just the highest frequency radiation. This is actually a mirror, but anyway. It's a mirror that reflects only high frequency radiation and, and it absorbs low frequency radiation. So it's a bandpass filter. And then they do a delay in focusing and they 
So here are the steps. The laser is <coughs> the gas jet. The emitted XUV rejects, is rejected off a mirror that, that it should be reflected. The emitted XUV reflects off a mirror that selects radiation around 90 dB. That is refocused into a second gas jet, and they do a streaking measurement of the emitted photoelectrons. You'll find out what streaking is the next time Paul talks. You'll know everything about streaking. But the point is, in a streaking measurement, you know how many pulses you have. Okay. And they look like they had one pulse. Here's the problem. It should not have worked. Okay. It should not have worked because the pulse they were using is too long. It wasn't a one and a half cycle pulse. It was at least a three cycle pulse. So there's many, many returns. Many, not many, many, but several returns. So the pulse is too long, and crucially, the carrier envelope phase was not controlled. So most of the pulses that they sent into the light, right, when the carrier envelope phase is not controlled, it means if you send in, you know, hundreds of thousands of laser pulses, the carrier envelope phase is just going to be a random variable that goes all over the place, right? And so if you have just one special carrier envelope phase, which is going to produce one single out of second pulse, and all of the other carrier envelope phases, or many of them, don't do that, they produce two or three, then you're not really going to make a measurement that shows you that you have a single out of second pulse. It shouldn't work. So, let me, you know, give the spoiler alert. It does work. I mean, they're not kidding. They did have a single out of second pulse. The question is why and how, and the answer is that the simple recipe is not what the physics follow. It's a coupling of space and time and ionization. So let's go back again. The pulse is too long, the phase is not controlled. Now here's the data. The data out of this experiment is really good. So here is the measurement of, by the single out of second pulse of the laser light field that had emerged from the gas. And this laser light field has a identifiable frequency, which is quite different from the frequency that got sent into the gas. What went into the gas is a 750 nanometer, seven femtosecond pulse, with an intensity, if there was no gas there, of about nine times 10 to the 14. And what they measure, looking at these um, oscillations is they were able to back out by a streaking measurement, which you will learn about, that they had an isolate, they had isolated 630 at a second pulses at a central frequency of about 90 dB. Now there's another interesting thing that you learn looking at these oscillations of the laser field which has gone through the gas, is it has a very large blue shift. The frequency has been changed by about 35%. It is blue shifted down to 620 nanometers or something. It's an enormous blue shift. And this is obviously the result of rapid ionization dynamics. So the question then occurs, what else is the rapid ionization dynamics doing? We know from this huge blue shift that there are rapid ionization dynamics. Something is happening. So the large blue shift was our start starting point because the blue shift is caused by the rapid change in the free electron density, which is something we can deal with. So here is our non numerical nonlinear medium calculation of what happened in that experiment. So you have to bear with me here for a minute. Here is a time axis in a moving coordinate frame, right? Moving at the speed of light. So here is a frozen light pulse. I know you can't really do this, but here it is. So you're looking at the light pulse that's going into the gas. And you're looking at it in time, so this is along the propagation axis, and this is perpendicular to the radiation, to the propagation axis. So this is the intensity profile of a focused laser pulse. It has these, the, the amplitude goes up and down, so when we square that, we get envelopes that go up and down, and you see as we go off axis, the intensity falls very quickly. So this is the pulse that goes into the medium. This is the pulse that comes out of the medium, and actually here it is. It is very, very different. It has been reshaped in a big, big way. You can see that now most of the big intensity peaks are actually happening off-axis, 
and in different places, and there's just a few high intensity places left on axis. And more than that, if I can make this happen again, you're going to see the movie happening here. The reshaping actually happens in the first half of the medium. And in the second half of the medium, basically, it stops changing. So we're about halfway through, and then the time propagation goes on and on and on. But you don't really see this change anymore. So here's what we said happens, and I think generally they agree with us. Aaron said, and Reiner uh, were very, very helpful in providing all the data for this experiment. So here's your initial pulse going in. You have a neon gas. What happens in there is very rapid ionization, and the driving pulse gets really reshaped in this very funny, odd-looking thing that even though it has lots of peaks, most of them are off-axis and in very rapidly changing spatial positions. So as a function of propagation distance, what we have, what we see is first, we see the laser intensity on axis starts high, but then drops rapidly. This is the defocusing. So the intensity drops rapidly to some sort of, um, something around a few times 10 to the 14. And the, frequency of the laser is rapidly blue shifted, we would say about 22%. So don't exactly match that 35% number, but uh, that doesn't take into account chirps and things. Anyway, so we get this rapid blue shift, and this is about halfway through the medium. Things have settled down. So here are the steps that we think happen. The blue shift builds up rapidly in the first half of the gas, while the intensity is still high. Defocusing reduces the on-axis intensity, consistent with a 90 eV cutoff, by the way. If they'd really put in 9 times 10 to the 14 all the way through the gas, they would have gotten harmonics out to 200 eV. They didn't see that. The highest harmonics they saw were around 90 eV. And slightly different laser focusing produces the 35% frequency shift. So, I mean, it depends exactly on how you do the focusing, how big a blue shift you get. But you get a very big one. And here is the harmonic yield around 90 eV. You see that the 90 eV harmonics are all generated in the back end of the gas. The gas density is very high. 90 eV radiation that's made in the beginning of the medium gets reabsorbed. So it's only the stuff in the back end of the medium that gets made that gets out of the medium. And that is made not by the pulse that's sent in, but that radiation, that 90 eV radiation, was made by this reshaped, funny-looking pulse. It really has only basically one peak on axis. So here is the radiation that comes out of the gas for a given CEP phase, a random one. And you see what you get is you get one pulse on axis, some little side bends, and you do get other out-of-second pulses, but these are off-axis. And if they're off-axis at the end of the gas, they're going to be even more off-axis after you propagate for a while. And that is what they did in the experiment. They took the radiation, they propagated it for a while, they bounced it off a mirror. The mirror is very small, so it selects only the central part of the radiation, and that was refocused. So here is, for example, in our calculation, here's a very, very messy output with many given, many different out of second pulses in here, right? Consistent with the fact that the experiment should work. If you propagate it out one and a half meters, put it on exactly the kind of mirror that they use and refocus it, for instance, you get two single out of second pulses. But these pulses have different divergences. And if you move the mirror back a little ways, like three meters, then you're only going to select one of these pulses. And long story short, this is how the experiment was done. For reasons that, as far as I can tell, have as much to do with the layout of the lab as anything, it's three meters and not one and a half meters. And, and it's, a, it's a very happy ending because of that. So we would say that this is a spatial filter in the far field, works as a time gate, and it isolates a single out of second pulse from many.
And we find actually, if, here's a curve for the seven femtosecond pulses that they were using. Um, if you define a single attosecond pulse as to be something that has a 10 to 1 contrast ratio to all the other pulses, then we would say that you get um, a single attosecond pulse uh, most of the time. That's this blue curve, and uh, it's, it's among the CP phases, it kicks that out more than half the time. So, and if you take 5 to 1, uh, it kicks it out about 3 quarters of the time. So, I think I want to stop here because I must have gone over time. But I hope that I've convinced you that there, you know, to, to think about from a theoretical perspective the generation, for instance, of attosecond radiation is very, very interesting. As far as I know, it's the only way to sort of separate these microscopic and macroscopic effects. And in many cases, and this is far not the only one, it's just the most fun one, uh, you can explain uh, how an experiment that shouldn't work actually does work. And we all know that those are the best experiments, right? I mean, that they, they, they work for simple reasons, and when you look at them in a more complicated way, they still work, but maybe for slightly more complicated reasons. So, thank you. Questions? Yeah. Questions up here. Could you bring the question? Uh, the <coughs> question is: Does the reshaping stop at some point, and why does it stop? And the answer is: If the intent, if the defocusing causes the intensity to fall low enough, to where the ionization rate is slow, uh, then it stops the reshaping. But you, you know, you're, then you have what you have. Right? So it gets reshaped in the first half of the gas, and then that's what's going through the second half of the gas. And because they were using a very high gas density, the radiation that's made in the back of the medium is reabsorbed in the medium. It doesn't get out, right? I mean, this is another thing we didn't mention, right? And it's also a problem with trying to get more photons by simply increasing the density, is you also increase the absorption of your radiation, right? I mean, you're making 90 EV radiation. Anything will, will absorb that, right? Any, any Anything you have has an ionization potential lower than that. So it will happily absorb that light. So you can't just sort of crank up the density endlessly. So you, you have a ton of, of free, quasi free electrons in your system, right? Yeah. Do you have to worry about coronal interactions between these guys? And if yes, does it mess up your planet? Right. There's always, there's always two answers to this. So the first is no, it doesn't mess, we don't worry about it. Okay. And it doesn't seem to mess anything up. And life seems to be great. Okay. Um, the other answer to that question is, yes, of course, there must be some effect of it. And, and this is why I get very um, excited uh, when I hear that the um, repetition rate of the next generation of high intensity lasers is going to be orders of magnitude higher than what we're using because this will allow us to get much, much better data, much more stable data, look at things in really uh, great detail, and then we'll find out that, yeah, we were, mo you know, we were mostly right. Yeah, no, right? but I'm, I'm wondering if you think that you are right because these effects are two orders or three orders of magnitude away, or just a factor of two. I think, I think it's orders, of, for that one, I think it's orders of magnitude. Okay. I wanted to just show, this is sort of an example. So this is an experiment from me uh, in Johan Morrison's group. Um, this is a paper on, on the archive. And this is kind of a very complicated uh, thing to look at, but I just want to make a point about details, right? So one detail that people say is, well, we only have to worry about two trajectories. 
there's one, a short trajectory that gives rise to light that's focused along the axis, and a long trajectory that gives rise to light that's focused off the axis. Mostly, um, what happens is people pick phase matching conditions, and I didn't talk about this, that give you just light along the axis. So this is a, here's divergence in this angle, and here is spectrum in this angle, and they've chosen a phase matching condition where they have very well resolved harmonics that are all along axis. So this you would say is sort of classic short trajectory. Here is, now they have changed the focusing conditions to where they have both long and short trajectories. So they have, for instance, for harmonics like this harmonic here, you have something that's very close to the axis and bright, which is kind of short trajectory. But you also have this piece that is very far off axis. And that's from the long trajectory. And if you have enough precision, enough counts, I think you can look within that and you can see, you should be able to see spatial interference fringes. This is what they think in Lund as well. See spatial interference fringes, which will show you the contribution of not just the long trajectory, but the longer than long and the longer than long. And now you're really thinking about very different trajectories, not something, you know, I'm going to do Paul's thing, right? Not just trajectories that go out and come back, but how about go out, come back, miss, then come back, right, on the back side of where they came out. And okay, for an atom, this is interesting, and it can give rise to interference fringes. But for a large molecule, this is maybe really interesting because you leave on one side of the molecule and come back on the other, and are there conditions under which that still gives you something? All sorts of interesting effects that will come as we go from standardly now, it's about 1,000 shots per second, go to 10,000, go to 100,000. This data was taken with a laser that performs, I think, at about 20,000 hertz, but it could run it to, at about 130. They didn't run it in that mode for this experiment. But I mean, they're getting just lots and lots of data. And, and the simple pictures that we're rolling out for you here with so much confidence will undoubtedly be modified, hopefully. So it's a, it's a field that I think has slowly always sort of joining with the rest of AMO physics, where precision is its goal. You know, there was a time when it was got kind of photons as its goal. Um, like how many could you get? And it was, you know, that phase matching. How do we make better phase matching? How do we get more photons? How do we get high energy, fo you know, higher energy photons? And these are all very interesting questions. But they're not precision driven questions, right? And then you have the rest of AMO physics, like you guys, that are really driven by precision, right? And I think hopefully we're joining Right. So is it is it fair to say that in your in your layers, okay, in the time scales of these, yes. these pulses, the atoms are frozen, essentially, right? So you have a frozen gas. Yes, for on, for on, the generation problem, there's the thermal frozen. time scale of the of the atoms to yes. be much 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 longer. Yes. yes. So yes. they don't they don't come into the play. That's right. For the generation problems, are frozen. So can I now think of if I if I it, 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 but, but your atoms are independent particles, right? They're still frozen by independent particles. Now, if I were to think of what would be the effect on the yield of these uh, harmonic generations if, if the picture was more correlated? Mm -hmm. I know that your wave functions, of course, would be much, much more uh, difficult to, uh, to, to, to solve in these. Uh, but if they were sort of correlated, not interacting, but just simply correlated, I don't know. I think the bigger effect uh, is probably to to take account of more electrons on the same emitter. Yeah, sure. Um, although that's something that sort of people have looked for multi-electron effects in the emission, and you know there are some examples of that. But by and large, even that, which I would think would be the first level of complication that would really come into play, uh, even that has only rarely been seen. Um, so, I think, in some sense, the level at which we're doing it, which is a single, you know, try and do the single electron or maybe the two electron problem as, as well as you can, and then couple that to the Maxwell equation and try and treat those effects, uh, that's keeping us busy, shall we say. Sure, sure. Yeah. Now, what I'll talk about next time is sort of the 
absorption of radiation, of XUV radiation in dress systems. And there, undoubtedly, the movement of the atoms, although we don't treat it right now, is definitely a thing. I mean, for sure. Because the emission can happen, on, the absorption happens over a much longer, longer time scale. It happens on the line, on the time scale of the line width. Right. So we can't, can't sort of force that to be a frozen problem. Yes. So we treat it that way right now, but it's an obvious area for improvement. Yes. Uh, let's thank you more questions. So uh, can you tell us how experimentalists fix and change their envelope phase? Um, I'll there a second later. Like do this or do that and we'll get a better signal. Yeah. So you you could, I mean now I don't know, maybe this is the turn off the camera part where I give it. I, I think that's not the game you want to be in. Um, because